Who is Hamza Ahmed? One word, traumatized. Sit on the floor for like an hour. He abused me, he was violent towards me, he was violent towards my brother, my sister, my mom. Hating him, swearing at him in my mind. To get us into the UK, it was extremely difficult. That's extremely emotionally mature of you, especially because I kind of know a bit about what you went through. Do you think at this point in your life, you Hamza, you're happy? For young men, sex, relationships, is incredibly important. We talk a lot about no fab and porn and uh, sex life. Your family are watching that. <laughs> what do you think happens when we die? I've been almost stabbed by guys, being racist, thinking that I'm like this Muslim terrorist bomber or something. Why does everything that feels good bad and everything that feels bad good? More pain, more pain, more pain. That's what we need in life. You know, you feel negative, I'm broke, I'm getting like transport to these interviews. I was genuinely waking up, smoking weed straight away from the morning. Reality hit me hard. And no one's coming to save you now. Nobody's no telling you, go here, go there. Yeah. You're on your own. How does someone with no money today, can they start making money? Like you, self-made millionaire. The single greatest tool that we have to make money, I think the new gold rush is step one. Welcome back to the show and thank you for returning back to the channel where we talk about business, advice, personal finance and happiness. Today's guest is popular self-growth and self-help YouTuber Hamza Ahmed who has amassed about 2 million subscribers across his main channel, his unfiltered channel and his Spanish channel and uploaded nearly a thousand videos on YouTube. His audience has named themselves as part of his cult which so strongly believes in the message which Hamza spreads online, which is about how to be successful in life, self-growth, discipline, delayed gratification, working on daily habits. We have a lot of good, real deep questions, personal questions. So without further ado, let's get into it. All I'm so right. grateful to be here, man. Thank no, you. No, bro, me. it's a big pleasure for me. Honestly, I've been a huge fan for since maybe like two years. I watched probably 50 videos, I'd say by now. To begin, I should ask you for a brief overview of your life, let's say like 30 second summary, who is Hamza Ahmed? If I said one word, probably leader now. Mm. But if I gave you a very short summary of my life, I'd yeah. say the, the word that, like I don't want to be negative st to start off, but the word that is in my mind, if I'm going to be truthful, is traumatized. That's the first thing that comes into my mind is early childhood years, lots of trauma, lots of abuse, setbacks. And even though I, I, I'm, you know, I don't want to be negative. Oh, yeah. let's be positive, guys. It is the truth, and I think that even makes the story better because somewhat overcoming that and making progress, and then you know, building some discipline, getting away from the bad habits that kept me hooked, the addictions and everything. And that gave you something to work on, and like basically gave you a purpose that like whatever happened to me has happened, but now I got to focus on what I can do to resolve the situation as best I can and the solutions that exist out there. Exactly. Yeah, damn. Yeah. But it's interesting that you say like, when you describe yourself as somebody who is traumatized, because often when you, when you go through something like that in life, it kind of becomes your identity. And um, how do you feel like it's, it's shaped you throughout your life? And if you want to dive a bit deeper into what traumatized you or like, what was the main things that happened in life that shaped this trauma? My father, mostly I'd say. Growing up, um, he called it discipline. Yeah. I called it abuse. Yeah. And so I went through uh, maybe hundreds of instances of, um, you know, violence and some neglect and uh, fear and threats and, you know, physical stuff. So um, something I learned about trauma is that, so PTSD, post-traumatic post stress, stress disorder, disorder, that can happen from one huge instance. Someone mugs you, for example, someone yeah. hits you, you get sexually assaulted or anything. And the phrases that the psychologists and the authors use in their books and, and podcasts and everything is that PTSD may be eased or may be cured through these protocols, these therapies, everything. Yeah. And that's one instance. Yeah. And then there's a more severe version of it, which is CPTSD, complex PTSD, which usually happens in childhood. And it means you essentially got PTSD again, hundreds again. of times. Yeah. So that... and. If they're saying, oh yeah, you know, like there's, there's probably a chance that you could probably, you know, like there's a 50% success rate with PTSD. Yeah. See, PTSD is one of those things. It's like with, in your early Compounding formative events. years, you don't feel safe. You're supposed to be able to run to your caregiver for safety. Yeah, and, and then when, it, when it's your caregiver doing the abuse, it's like, where do you run to? Yeah. So at least for me, when I was growing up, the, um, the place that I'd run to was video games and the virtual world. And 
Do you know that that's the place that where I was safe. It's so like you were trying to escape. Yeah, exactly. So in the virtual world, in RuneScape, I'm a dragon slayer. Mm. I've got so many friends. I'm in a clan, and you know we're all brothers. We're gonna go kill some dragons and everything. I've, look at me. I've got this high level in this skill that gets me a status. There's a sense of community and exactly. But then you could go. in the real world, I'm this kid who's like you know, getting hurt and everything. Yeah. So this was my early life experience. And I, I don't want to have, you know, a negative identity. Oh, yeah. you know, woe is me, I'm a victim and everything. I've never saw myself as a victim, but uh, recollecting over my life recently, cause I'm writing a book and I'm writing about like my early childhood experiences. And you know, there's like one instant comes to mind. So I'm writing about that, but then another instant comes and then another and another and another and another and another. And then you start realizing, oh, this, you know, like- It was a lot that you went through. Yeah. yeah. And I, I'm sure like writing must be the craziest experience because you have to really work through all that stuff. But I, I think that there's like a beauty in that. Cause like, as you're writing it, you're kind of like letting it go to a certain extent. I mean, I'm sure it's extremely hard to fully let go of these events. But I'm sure it helps in kind of like uh, moving on from that and, you know, working through the like understanding what happened and the emotions and basically the whole situation, you know. I know that that's something that a lot of children suffer with and it sucks. But how's the relationship with your dad now? Would you say it's totally different? It, so I grew up and he was the, the dominating, disciplining man and you know i was scared of him like i can tell you some examples it, he was always going to come home at 6 30 p.m after work so 6 29 p.m i take a book and just go sit in the toilet lock the door sit on the floor for like an hour because yeah. if he comes upstairs usually he'd go check where i am usually i'd get a beating for in my opinion no reason you know i'm a six-year-old or something he maybe had a stressful day and stuff yeah but if, if, if i'm hidden away for like 20 minutes it's almost like he's forgotten me okay he's just drinking downstairs usually that means i'm kind of fine or maybe drinking he'll do alcohol. yeah maybe he'll do another round upstairs at like 9 p.m to check my um homework planner slap me for some reason because like you know there's a homework due tomorrow and that's like punishable for some <laughs> do you know what I mean so I, I went through some stuff man and um yeah literally just like go hide in the toilet for an hour Damn. before he comes home I, i'm allowed one hour of video games so it's like you know that's okay fair enough one hour sweet but for the rest of the day through school through everything i'm thinking about the virtual world i can't you know i'm disassociating in classrooms teachers talking right now i can't even like listen to her properly my mind is elsewhere we've got a homework assignment to read this book i can read barely one sentence before my mind disassociate so it's like i couldn't read up until age 22 23 obviously yeah. i can read english no problem but like i couldn't actually like read more than a couple sentences yeah. without disassociating i think video games are especially like extremely addictive yeah they can really rob you of your attention yeah totally so even like when you're not playing just the whole day it's just going on in the back of your head so me and sam said this i said to him just randomly it ended up being like a quote that we like which was that we started with gold skinned guns you know like on yeah. call of duty and then we move on to rolexes to fancy cars as as boys as men even before puberty as, as just males we it's always we just wanted status it's we it's always it's did signaling and it, yeah and it was just so interesting because you know it's just normal oh you know you're a kid you want to get the gold gun yeah. you want to get the cape on on minecraft you want to get like the dragon skimitar on, on runescape and you think yeah that's just what you do but then you realize oh <laughs> it's because deeper. of status mm -hmm. it's it is built inside of us and it, it's it's quite malicious how it happens on video games because they kind of understand the male desire for status, for brotherhood, for competition, for yeah. domination. Yeah. And they invite all these things into this video game, which essentially gives most, like, I mean, video games are 50, 50 male and female these days, but yeah. for at least for the boys, it gives them a place to seek status away from the real world. And then it gets into this, trap. this cycle, this trap where now they can't even like leave because you know, like I said, in the video game, they got the gold skin gun. Yeah, why but would they ever want to turn on the real world where they're not nobody? Exactly. So when guys come to me and they're, they're trying to quit video games, because that's a lot of my work yeah. is, you know, these bad habits that we've gone into. Mm. We know that, that, you know, it can be fine sometimes in moderation, but the issue is like, it's very hard to moderate something that's purely yeah. addictive. The transition period from being a gamer to not a gamer is very difficult because generally that means that their real life isn't that great yeah. to begin with. So they have, they have a lot of work to do basically. Yeah. Damn. And then how, uh, just as we're wrapping up the topic about your dad, how did you work on resolving that issue and how is the relationship now? I discovered what mental health was okay. when I was 23 years old. I just stumbled upon. It's actually it, pretty late, you know? That's, that's yeah. the issue in society. Yeah. How, yeah. At 20, before 23, you didn't even know what mental health was. Yeah, totally. Like, I, you know, it, it, people talked about it. You know, you see it on like Instagram or something. People, oh, you know, it's okay for men to cry and stuff. Talk to yeah. your friends. But like, it never opened up my mind of what it actually was. Yeah. It was only when I started to see the science of it, like I took an online course called The Science of Wellbeing. It was on Coursera for free. It's by Yale University. Nice. Free course, amazing. Just tells you like the, the research behind happiness and depression and anxiety. And you know, it tells you that um, the things that we've chased all of our lives actually don't result in any happiness. 
So good job, good money, good house, even marriage, uh, even uh, body transformations, literally, the th and good grades, all these things that we actually, like, you know, our perceived happiness score once we achieve that thing mm. is very high. Yeah. And then when you actually do achieve the thing, the the marriage, the good grades, barely barely significant, and usually it goes back to baseline. So happy, um, marriage is that, the two-year honeymoon, and then goes back to baseline, right, good yeah. bodies, that, everything, you adjust to everything. There's the weird things that improve your well-being and happiness are things that we weren't taught in school. It's meditation, kindness, gratitude, it's social connection, it's being out in nature, it's exercise, good sleep, and good diet. Right. They're the only things, and uh, competition, mostly for men, they're, they're the only things that actually have been like scientifically shown to improve happiness. Yeah, happiness, yeah. Not just like quick doses of dopamine. That's what they, that's what they teach us in school. Yeah, well that, that's not even happiness. The, yeah, the, the they, bad habits yeah. that lead to some kind of like pl pleasurable, positive feeling. It's not really real. You know, people say like, oh no, video games make me happy. No, no, not, no, not really. Short term like, happy and then long term sad. Yeah, it, it, there's always, so Andrew Huberman says that there's always like a peak and then a drop, specifically a drop below the baseline when yeah. you do any of these like bad habits, which essentially means that, okay, you might feel good right now playing video games, drinking, smoking weed, eating junk food. Yeah, it will give you some kind of high, but you, you will go down after that and not just to where you were before, but to actually Deeper. below. Mm -hmm. And now if you do that every single day for four hours a day, for six hours a day, every day for years, eventually your baseline is so low that now we're having some significant problems. Depression. Yeah. Yeah. And it makes it makes a lot of sense because um, as as you do it again and again, obviously now you do it and then you feel guilty about it, you feel sad. So now you're looking for distractions. So again, you get on the video games, and yeah. then it's like a just a loop. Yeah, when you feel bad about watching porn and you berate in yourself and you want a little bit of comfort from yeah. this negativity, then the place you go to for comfort is porn. Is yeah. <laughs> so it's a very bad cycle to get into. Yeah, that's crazy. And did you ever like go up to your dad and where you're like, I forgive you and. Yeah, 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 you're saying. So so I discovered the mental health course and it talks about gratitude. And the, yeah. this was the thing that changed it all for me, at least for my relationship with my father. The, the most beneficial thing I've done is meditation. And that, you know, how I said the dissociation, like that got cured for me with meditation. But with gratitude, that was the thing that uh, resolved my family issues, at least on my side. That um, this lecturer in this online course, she gave out this task to journal about some things that you're grateful for. And eventually I took like another course that said, oh, you know, like another form of gratitude practice is to write a letter of gratitude to someone and to specifically try and do it to someone that you have some problems with. So I chose my father and I'm sat there with an empty page, hating him, swearing at him in my mind, thinking, no, what, like, what have I got to be grateful yeah. for? Do you know what I mean? It, like he, he abused me, he was violent towards me, he was violent towards my brother, my sister, my mom. I've hated him my entire life. Never once thought a positive thought about him, but then doing this practice with this empty page in front of me and then I started to write, okay, you know what? I've just started to work full-time jobs. I'm 23 years old at this point, I'm 25 now. And working full-time sucks, bro, especially for a job that you don't want. So I'm, yeah. I'm thinking, wait, my father's worked more than full-time, like two jobs most of his life to yeah. provide for us. My mother is a housewife, so she doesn't she work. Doesn't it's work. very traditional. One. He's, he's putting in work, so I'm grateful that he's worked so hard. And then, you know, I, I start to like, I don't know where this came from, but I start to see the privilege that I've had that I grew up in the UK. Yeah. And um, I've went to good schools, I've, I've graduated with a psychology degree. My brother's you graduated. graduated. Yeah. yeah. Brother's gradu graduated with medicine. He makes wow. a lot of money. My sister graduated with politics. Wow. And I start to think, wait, my dad always said this, like his goal was to get his children through a British education. It was always the reason why we moved to the UK. And I think, wait, he accomplished that. I'm, that's all right. Okay, I'm grateful that we got a British education. Because I started to wonder, okay, where would I actually, you know, I, I never felt grateful for being in the UK. Oh, the weather's, you know, you focus, you oh, the weather's bad. Yeah. yeah. But then I started to think, wait, where would I be right now? If I didn't go there, if I was still in Pakistan, and you know my English was twenty percent worse than it is, and you know all, all of this stuff, and I started the to think, wait, opportunities, the you know the network, network, even like culture, yeah, even like uh, social media and like just technology as well. It's not as advanced, and yeah, totally. And the education's the, probably the, the biggest part of it, at least in my perception. And um, yeah. specifically, I thought this story that my dad told me, which was that to get us into the UK. It was extremely difficult. You know, like I started to think, okay, how did he actually manage? So we were born in Pakistan. We didn't have visas or yeah, passports yeah, or anything. Yeah. So how do we go from the there to the, do you know what I mean? And then I, I messaged them once and I'm grateful that you brought us to the UK. So many yeah. opportunities. And I don't ever talk like that to my dad, right? And yeah. he replied back with like 20 messages. Wow. And the first message he, he wrote back was in Pakistan, I had 500 men working below me who called me sir. And I had high status, a really good job that I liked. 
in the UK, I've worked as a laborer for 20 years. Mm. He works as a taxi driver. He's been beaten up by people who get in, the racist guys get in the taxi drunk. They beat him up. And so, so every now and then, like every six months, he comes yeah. home with like bloodied up face and shit. Yeah. He's worked in a corner store. Same thing. So you see the worst of British society when the guys are coming in to, to buy alcohol. They, they don't have ID. They're 17 years old. So they start throwing shit on the floor. I remember I used to go to the corner store sometimes to like, you know, help my dad with some things and spend time there. And people like older guys from my school or something would come in and be racist. Oh, you yeah. smell like curry. You know, he's seeing this shit. And like, you know, it only just hit me. It's like, why was he working the sacrifices? These? Yeah. You know, you, you don't really, like, at least I, for a long time, didn't really think, why is he here? Yeah. Well, because of me, it's not like he wants to work this job. He's here because of me. And then, you know, I'm, like, I'm getting really emotional messaging him. And he tells me the story of how he actually got the visas for us, where he had to travel, like, you know, to a, a way different city in, um, in Pakistan. And it, it's, he said it was like amongst the mountains and to get to the visa embassy it took a few hours and then you had to, it was open at seven and only a few people could get in. So you had to line up for hours beforehand. He went oh like three goodness. times, wasn't able to get Jeez. inside. That kind of it's stuff always struggle. like agitates me, you know, yeah, like if there's something you've got to do and you can't get in and you've got to go again and again and again. So frustrating. Is, and imagine doing that. There's no, there's no organization. You, you don't even know what you're This is before the internet, time. bro. This yeah. is before Google maps or anything. And you know, yeah. oh, okay, they open at seven. It's like, you're just told by a friend. Oh yeah, they open at seven today yeah, or something. Damn. And he told this story which I told Sam recently that he would line up amongst all these guys to try and get in and he would always see richer, more successful people drive up with their drivers around 6.55, get out and then trade places with their servants who had been waiting uh, for them. Essentially, they had outsourced yeah, the position the, in the, the line yeah. and like, you know, my dad would see it and everything. He eventually gets in and gets like a six month visa, but he wanted a three year one. And you know, like he like argues with them and everything, eventually gets the visa, then eventually travels to the UK, sees that it's good there, you know, organizes it all. And I'm like- And you had no family in UK before. So he's, nothing, just, nothing. he's just thinking about this place, like a fan like UK and he doesn't know what's gonna be there. And he's just like, I need to go there. Just massive risk. Massive. Leaving all his, like all his generations have just been there, his forefathers and in Pakistan. And everyone's probably looking at him like, why are you going to UK or, you know, what are you doing? The, the status, it's interesting we spoke about status before this because the status hit that he took for me, because he, he was really well up in, in Pakistan, you know, literally guys calling him sir. He, he was high up in a paper mill as an engineer and everything. Mm. And in the UK, he's a taxi driver. Damn, yeah. He took that status hit for me, for my brother, for my sister, so that we could have a good education. And for the first time ever, so I'm writing all this down, right in the gratitude letter, for the first time ever, I'm seeing the positive sides to him. Mm. And that changed my perspective completely, especially because I was working a really like low end full-time job. I was working in customer service. So I hated my life and everything. I, I only knew how it felt for a couple a of months. Bit, yeah. You know, he had done this for 20 years and I was only working full-time. He was working 60 to 70 hours and stuff, right? Yeah. And so eventually I did, I moved back. So this was, a, I was, you know, in a different city at this point. I eventually moved back home and then I write him a formal letter. I'm grateful for this. I'm grateful that you did this. And um, it's, it feels cringe, it feels awkward, but I'm thinking, okay, I'm gonna read it to him. So I, I hear him coming up the stairs. I tell him, come here, sit him down. He, it's already, oh, we don't do this stuff, right? This is cringe yeah. and for us, right? Like, but I sit him I down. Mean, I don't mean it's cringe, but I know I can understand this might be so hard. Don't, it, with, you know, usually with dads, you don't really have this kind of, like with my mom, I can open up a bit more. And, but with dads, a bit like you feel like you want to be a man and you don't want to it's, it's not like emotional. i mean in some levels it's that but it's also just like you know it's totally out of character for yeah. us you know me and me and my dad have always been a very logical just like okay objective focused yeah, yeah, yeah. okay how are you you're good not sick money okay food okay okay you're goodbye. fine Boom. yeah that's that's yeah, how we yeah. talk right so when i did sit him down i said both of us locked uncomfortable and i start to read him <laughs> and i just you know i say oh, i wrote something for you it just feels cringe yeah. and i start reading it and you know i'm, I'm yeah. grateful that you brought us to the uk i'm grateful that you've worked so so long so hard for us yeah. i'm grateful that you've provided as, as a father with you know a housewife as well who's not making money or anything as a one man i'm grateful that you've taken jobs that you've probably haven't even liked just for us mm. and i yeah. begin like you know tearing down and he's tear, like tearing up Damn. a bit as well and i give him the letter and it's it's all okay right then um so that's that's how it, like you know our relationship yeah, yeah, changed was, but one extra was... part of this story is that like about two years later so just a few months ago I mentioned it on a video, this this story. And um, I mentioned it again to my dad. Oh, you know, I just told that story. And he like gets really happy and he just opens up his wallet and no. it's in there. At that, when was that two years later? Yeah. No way, that's crazy. That's sweet, isn't it? Yeah. I bet like every like now and then, like he just pulls out and reads it whenever he's feeling sad. Yeah. That's crazy. I think that's extremely emotionally mature of you, especially because I, I kind of know a bit about what you went through. And for you to understand like whatever's happened, you can't change change it and 
feeling that hate for him is like a punish. They say anger is a punishment you give yourself for someone else's wrongdoings or someone else's mistakes. So it's extremely mature of you to to re- understand that like I should not keep this inside of me, and there's no it doesn't benefit me to have that hatred. Totally. Well, a good friend of mine in the gym that I used to go to back in the UK, he told me about this concept of letting go yeah. and forgiving, and he said like. I, 20 times a day, 50 times a day, there are things that you probably should let go. And we don't really realize this, but like we're holding on to things purposefully because of resentment this and you know, because of the wrong mindset. And so when he told like I'm a very like practical specific guy. So specifically, if there's anyone watching this who's, whose brain is like mine, maybe it'll click for them. He said literally 20 to 50 times a day, there will be some kind of emotion, feeling, thought that you should let go, that you should cue but yourself, we okay, let it go, let it go. We indulge in it. Yeah. We, we, we like feeling, it. well, we like feeling bad sometimes. The thing is we don't, we hate feeling bad but we keep doing it. Mm. When you get that thought of that that BS that someone else put you through, that memory from the person it, from high school, that, that atrocity that happened, the betrayal. That sometimes you open, look them up on Instagram, you you know, you- that, That's you, when you get quite serious, yeah. you're, you're literally doing the actions. But sometimes you're just going through the yeah. day, you're just showering and you think about that asshole who bullied you or something. And you know, it's, it seems weird for me to say, yeah, let go, but it's this isn't for them. Yeah. I'm not saying it for them, I'm saying it for you. For you, exactly. Forgiveness is entirely for selfish. Yeah, Forgiveness yeah. is selfish, it's that's for true. yourself. And so I, I, cause I, I'm not perfect as bro. I resent a lot of people, do you know what I mean? I struggle yeah. to be, to forgive. But when I do remember that quote, forgiveness is selfish. I start to realize, you know what? By me forgiving this person, it's not really for them. It's, it's for, for me so I can let go and I can move on to yeah. the next, the next thing I've got to let go exactly, from. Yeah. Do you think at this point in your life, you Hamza, you're happy? Yeah. You are? Yeah. And what, what does happiness look like? Is it like, do you think that happiness comes from like, I wrote this down here, do you think it's like a byproduct of you being on this mission that you're on and happiness is just is just a result, like a byproduct of you just focusing on your goals and progression because you've spoken about that or do you think that happiness is something that we can actively work on, actively um, index for, target, you know? Mm. What do you think? My understanding is there's for men, for masculine people, there might be women who are masculine. For masculine people, there's two stages of happiness and for uh, feminine people, there's probably two as well, okay? So first of all, we need the baseline. We need the good sleep, the good health. That That's undeniably important mm. for, for happiness. If you're lacking sunlight, like 80% of the world is, you know, they wake up, they check their phone, whatever, and maybe they go outside to like yeah, get in their car to drive to work. And they've yeah. had quite literally five seconds of sunlight till 5 p.m. and then it's dark. It's like most people literally live in the darkness. And Andrew Huberman talks about this a lot. You need to see, like literally need, your eyes need to see sunlight yeah. to feel a little bit happy. Because a few now when I wake up, the first thing I do is open the curtains. Exactly, exactly same, yeah. And then the same, like a lot of people, like, it sense, like, you know, the common sense, before, but bro, yeah. a lot of people are literally dehydrated. A lot of people's like gut microbiomes all messed up. They're eating the wrong food for, for their genetic profile and everything. And if you improve your sleep, all, all the baseline things, yeah. that's like, you know, like just not sexy, but it's like, okay, we've just got to, first of all, Business, everyone needs to hit the, yeah, we need to hit the fundamentals first. That one, let's talk about, okay. Mental. For masculine people, my understanding is that happiness comes from progress to important goals. I feel happy when there is an important goal, important mission, and I'm making good progress to it. For the last, like, just recently, you know, I'm, I feel really happy. Last year for solid, solid months, like Sam knows this, like I wasn't feeling very happy. You know, yeah, we've got goals for YouTube. We've got goals for oh, like bodybuilding and stuff, but something was like missing. I wasn't living to my edge, to my potential. And then when I told you recently that I'm getting more into fighting and now I'm training, exercising for like four hours a day. And yeah, that's that's overtraining 100%. A lot of people shouldn't do this. But now that I have like a very clear goal, which is to win multiple fights this year in amateur fights, it's like, I'm so happy. Yeah. Literally, I have a smile. I'm, I'm in the gym three hours a day with a smile on my face now because yeah. I'm progressing to this very important goal. I have like this this um, note tap on my phone where I write down how many hours I've done each day yeah. and just seeing it add up. So I'm on like 149 hours right now. Seeing it add up is like, that's my greatest sense of joy. I, I'm in the gym mid set with, um, oh, after after the set with our rest, I'm just shouting us. I'm like, oh bro, this is amazing. I'm like, yeah. you know, even if I had to sacrifice YouTube for this, bro, I do, I just like training <laughs> no, and listening to music, Please. you know what I mean? And so that, that's what my perception of, of happiness to masculine people is progress to goals. And then happiness from my understanding for feminine people, which can be men or women is um, just love. Mm-hmm. Mostly just love, really? mostly from the romantic relationship that they've got, the the crush that they've got or the partner that they have. And then also maybe 20% from the love that they share with family and friends. Mm-hmm.
That's my understanding. Giving well. and receiving. Yeah, totally. So mm. if, for example, you're a feminine person, you probably can't feel happy if the love of your life right now is feeling a bit bad and, you know, the other person feels distant or maybe, you know, you've got a crush and the other person's not reciprocating yeah. it. And if you're a masculine person, you can't feel happy if you don't feel like you're making really good progress yeah, to your goals. I, I need like, I need to feel productive. If I don't have a productive day, I'm sad. Like I, I don't feel like my sleep is deserved and I just feel like I've wasted the day, you know? Yeah, totally. So, well, you just told me your goal be before this podcast that you want to get to 1 million subscribers yeah. by the end of this year. And it, when you see yourself making progress to that and you see the YouTube yeah. analytics going up, it's like, it's going to get, you know, we shouldn't be externally motivated or we should just do yeah, things. Yeah, and yeah. of course we should, but that's going to make Set you targets, incredibly yeah. happy to see progress. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and you gave me a good point, which you said was like, and if there's anyone who's watching this, who's aspiring to be a YouTuber, you said you should look at the watch time. Watch the, yeah, just a quick tip. If there's any like aspiring YouTubers, uh, setting goals based on subscribers is what I used to do. And I don't think it's that accurate or, or that effective because as I said to you, there's, there's a lot of channels out there with lots of subscribers, 500K, 1 million, 2 million subscribers. They yeah, get like, on the bro, views, 10, 000, they get 10,000, 20, 20,000 views. Mm. Like I feel embarrassed for them, no offense. Like yeah. I mean, we see that and it's one of the most uncomfortable things for me is seeing a channel that eventually, like at one point rose but and then, then now it's just that, dying off. Like, yeah. And they've still got the same subscribers. You never really lose subscribers on YouTube anymore. Your videos just stop getting shown to people. Yeah. And so I don't and think- everyone can see it as well. That's one thing people don't understand about YouTube. Yeah. Your whole career, like you have a number that shows how well you're doing in your career. Yeah. But the real number that matters, it isn't the, the subscriber, it's, the it's people People can see the views, so they'll base you on how many views your videos get. But I think that the single greatest metric to focus on as a YouTuber is actually your monthly watch time and to set goals based on that to that go up roughly, yeah. roughly 10% every single month. Increase. I think that's a really good good yeah. uh, number to reach for because your watch, right, subscribers feels nice. And you know, my goal for the end of this year is 5 million subscribers, yours is 1 million. It feels kind of nice, you know, it's really motivating and you can still do that. But watch time is the real metric because that shows attention. Attention, yeah. Increased watch time means more views, more revenue, more subscribers, more positivity everything. more attention it's everything overall. increase subscribers more, yeah. all it, it means, means more videos yeah yeah, yeah. And, and when you do focus on watch time then you start to actually start to produce videos you know you start to like make these little changes where you think okay how can we get a little bit more attention watch, yeah, from each yeah. video, video uh, from each viewer the thumbnail how does the thumbnail have to be what can i do can i reply to more comments is that gonna keep them more engaged description you know so you have to think about really everything damn and i wanted to ask you does your family watch your videos yeah, every, every single day. Do you feel like, do you feel like, because you know, you talk a lot about nofap and porn and like yeah. your sex life. Yeah. And do you feel like your family are watching that? And because you know, I, I, I've always wondered this and no, I don't think anyone's ever asked you this, but. Yeah, that, uh, no, that's a good question. Uh, when I first, so for around six months when I started uploading videos, it was just about like self improve <laughs> like, you know, like all oh, the good habits and everything. Okay, yeah. dopamine detox and stuff. You didn't open up too much. Not too much. And then when I spoke about relationships and I'd mentioned that, oh, you know, there was this girl I was dating and this and then like, your porn and you know, like the of PG-18 things, Your vices. then um, <laughs> there's been multiple times my mom comes to me and she's like proper sad and upset and like stop talking like you gonna cheese can eat <laughs> like you know she said oh don't talk about these dirty yeah. things and everything our family in Pakistan watch and I, I, I do try and take it seriously I do want to take her advice but the thing is I've tried to she doesn't understand this, but I've tried to say, like for young men sex relationships is incredibly important even if let's say you don't want to date yeah okay you're Muslim you want to yeah. arrange marriage you're not going to date a woman right now mm. but to have some kind of relationship knowledge is incredibly important because no matter what religion you are, no matter f what faith or or the way that you want to navigate your dating life, you still will have quite a lot of thoughts about dating women, yeah, girls, and even everything. porn, masturbation, all this. Of course, so it, it feels like dirty to talk about it, but I think if it's necessary, I think it's necessary. I think a l like if there was there was categories of young men's problems, suffering, and mental headaches. Dating would be the, the top one, not even close. I guess they feel lonely in their life, you know? Totally. So yeah, we spoke a bit about religion right now. I wanna ask you like, what, what do you think happens when we die? For a large part of my life, I've believed nothing. I haven't believed in the afterlife or heaven and hell and everything. Like I grew up as, uh, my parents raised me as a Muslim for a good few years. And then I, I don't wanna place blame or anything, but like I grew up in a quite atheist, British society yeah. and you know, no God's, you know, everyone's saying it casually, God's not real, look, science, big bang theory, oh, oh religion's bad, oh, Muslim's bad, look, yeah. Muslim terrorists. It's almost terrorist, like you're like, as if you're dumb, if you're religious, like, yeah. you know, not no science, you know yeah. what I mean? Like, it, that, the tide is turning, yeah. honestly, like this is a huge respect to Andrew Tate, honestly, the tide's yeah, turning he, because he, he, he added a lot more respect to religion yeah. because before, you know, just a few years ago, 
religion, especially Islam, was almost like widely seen as a bad thing in the Western world. Yeah. Terrorists, bad Uncool, people, immigrants, all this stuff. And you know, I grew up seeing this stuff on the news that, oh, immigration, look, lots of brown people, bad thing. What are we gonna do about the immigration problem? What are we gonna do about the terrorists? Look, terrorist, bad thing. Terrorist attack rises. I've been attacked multiple times. Always after terrorist attacks, Damn. hate crime in the UK goes up by 300%, See, 300 to huh? 500%. I've been attacked. I've been almost stabbed by guys Jeez. being racist, thinking that I'm like this Muslim terrorist bomber or something. And so obviously that's all, that's always made me think, okay, ah, Muslim religion, bad. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Do you know what I mean? So no, 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 I'm, I'm an atheist guy. So, you yeah, know, I'm, yeah, yeah. do you know what I mean? So I've, I've pushed away from, from faith and religion for a very long time in my life. And now you've seen it. It's like, I've got, I have this huge respect for the men. Yeah. And, you have the Quran on, on your, on top of your setup. Which yeah, I've seen. yeah. You try to read it as much as you can. Yeah. So. It's a very slow process. Cause of course, I, yeah. I don't like a lot of people have asked me, you know, I've made videos last year about, oh, you know, I'm considering religion. And a lot of guys come to me and say, why, why don't you just become a, a, a Muslim? And you know, why, why don't what are you waiting for? Yeah. But I always like, to me, that seems very disrespectful. Up yeah. until I've read the entire book and I've spoke to a hundred religious guys, bro, this, this is a lifelong commitment. I'm yeah. not, if, the fact that I haven't told you that I'm a Muslim yet, like I'm still technically an atheist. The fact that I haven't, I think shows a lot more respect yeah. for the religion than if I just said straight away, oh guys, I'm a Muslim now. Yeah, because, because you're treating it seriously. Yeah, it might be a few solid years before I do it because I know that the, mo the moment I say to myself, okay, I'm Muslim now, I have to die as a Muslim. Yeah. Do you I mean, I'm not gonna, not be a Muslim five years. You're not gonna half-ass it. Nah. Yeah. There's there's a hundred thousand arguments in my mind that need to be processed first. Yeah, and that's fair. I don't think people should follow things blindly. And I was telling you this last night. I don't know. Uh, I was like, basically, the way I look at it, sometimes I talk to some of my uh, atheist friends or basically friends that are just not so religious as me, and they, I tell them like, let's assume for argument's sake, God doesn't exist. Let's just say for argument's sake, he does. There's no God. I tell them, why would you still not lead a life where like if you, something bad ever happened to you, you always felt like there was a higher power out there that was kind of like looking out for you. And if something could happen, you could always be grateful. And just in general, just feeling like you have, something's gonna happen after you die. Because otherwise it's just nihilism, you know? You're, you're just, the moment you're born, you're just waiting till you die, you know? So I think having that, just having that belief in a God will just help you. And, and it's not like God's telling you anything that God tells you not to do is usually bad for you. And there's nothing that God tells you not to do, which is good for you. And there's nothing which he tells you to do, which is bad for you. Mm -hmm. So it's basically just being a good person and, you know, um, doing things, a lot of things like you preach, you know, um, delayed gratification. And because basically, if you think about the whole, basically the whole religion is basically one big delayed gratification. Yeah, you're just yeah. waiting for heaven. Yeah, I, I realized <laughs> this once and I was like, whoa. Like that's when I one huge the, delayed the gratification. The concept of heaven is literally the ultimate delayed gratification. Delayed like what I spoke about before, you know, the pain, the uh, the pleasure of the bad yeah. habit, and then you go below baseline. But you know, the opposite version of that is is the pain of a good habit, like exercise or being kind or whatever. There's some level of pain and discomfort to that. But then afterwards, it's like the pleasure and the yeah. happiness goes up. We delay gratification for our future yourselves when we put in some yeah, hard work exactly. well heaven is the ultimate delayed gratification yeah. heaven is the ultimate like sacrifice of today for tomorrow's benefit yeah. when you tell someone okay follow these things that will be good for your life especially because once you pass away you will get into like the good version yeah. of reality yeah and i feel like if you're not religious then you're just like not you don't feel like there's any reason you should really be a good person because it's not accountability you know you can do something behind the scenes you might you might think you might get away with it but if you believe like that no like when i die i'm going to be questioned about the actions i did i have to be careful i have to I have to move intentionally, you know? And yeah, I mean, and like you're talking about the pleasure pain thing, like everything, it's, it's so crazy that most of the things in life, like basically from what I found, like 95% of things that are enjoyable at first are bad for you, you know? Yeah. And it often feels like, what's your advice like to someone who feels like they're really at war with their vices? They're thinking like, why does everything that's good, that feels good, bad for me, you know? I'm sure you get this question all the time. Like, why does it? Why does everything that feel good bad, and everything that feels bad good? Why is the cold shower good? Why is you know the avoiding the the snacks good? You know? Yeah. Well, uh, I'll take. Uh, I'll give a summary from what I've learned from Andrew Huberman like this, because this is more sciencey stuff and yeah. and it's uh, it's all about dopamine. So dopamine was seen as like the pleasure molecule, the it's not really. Hormone. It's more actually about motivation and the pursuit of something. So, you know, back in the caveman days, we got dopamine as we smelt food or we smelt, like, you know, we heard water or something. Oh, let's get over there. But then when you do the thing, your dopamine doesn't actually increase that much. It's the pursuit, or something. it's the motivation the forward, thing, right? So it's motivation just means that you, okay, you feel good to go and do the thing soon, right? So we feel like incredibly motivated essentially we feel a lot of dopamine when we're about to do something that's going to be very stimulating porn video games junk food drugs everything right but how 
what I've learned about dopamine from Andrew Huberman's podcast is that there will, there will always be a peak and then a drop below baseline for anything pleasurable. So if let's say just to quantify it, our normal baseline of dopamine is 50, 50 just yeah. to quantify. Five, yeah. And if we go and watch porn, it's going to go up to 75. Oh no, even more, about 100 or something. It's going to double, right? Which yeah. is huge, right? And that seems okay, okay, whatever. And then, you know, okay, oh, we go back to 50. No, 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 you don't. You don't go back to 50. Your baseline now is 40. Yeah. And now you feel a little bit worse tomorrow, don't you? You know, you're, you you watched a bunch of porn, you, you nut it a few times, every day. Okay, but you're on 40. I feel kind of bad. The thing I do when I feel bad is watch porn. Okay, I'm at 90. Yeah, pretty good. Oh yeah, nice man. Oh wait, I'm at 30 now. Mm. And again, it compounds. up to 80, down to 20, and eventually you're at like zero, minus 20, whatever. And eventually you have to pay the price of the, of the pleasure that you've just had with pain. Yeah. And the way to reverse this, just two simple words that I've been saying to myself over and over and over again, more pain, more pain, more pain. <laughs> That's what we need in life. If you want to have a happy life, if you want to have a life of, of happiness and, and joy, you need to go and pursue some more pain in something that's, that's reasonable, in something that means a lot to you. You need to go and sacrifice and feel uncomfortable, especially as a man, to feel uncomfortable yeah. for some pursuit of something important. Let's say your physique. You go and put in the work today and it feels painful. Sometimes it can feel, you can love the gym, but sometimes it, it's genuinely really painful to go to failure course, on a yeah, set. Yeah. And you know, that's just resistance training. Let's say you really go and do the thing that's, that's genuinely tricky for you. So for me, it's like ice baths, it's cold, it's really painful for me. Another guy might be cardio, another guy might be weightlifting, another guy, it could be stretching. Whatever it you specifically go and find the thing that's painful for you and then you do it because just like, you know, there was the rise and then the drop below baseline, there's actually the inverse of that with pain, that with pain, our dopamine goes down first and then it shoots up above baseline for hours. So for example, Huberman said this, an oh, ice sure. bath can increase your dopamine by two, three times for like three hours wow. afterwards. So you literally like, it, you actually get like it. almost a new baseline for a little while. You get like this way bigger peak. And um, I, I also learned this in a non-scientific way from a guy that I met in Thailand who was covered in tattoos, literally up to like <laughs> all here, everywhere, right? I know that that's like a huge process. So I asked him how long it took. He said like almost 200, 200 hours of wow. being needled, right? And he, he just gave me like this, this thing, which I don't think he knew the science of it, but he just said, I've done it because it was painful and I needed to pay for the pleasure that I've had in life. Wow. Deep. Based. Yeah, based. <laughs> he was a very based guy, wasn't he? <laughs> <laughs> So what are your thoughts on arranged marriage? You know, I didn't think about it for a long time, but I spoke to you. So you, you told me that you wanted to get one. Yeah. You, not even that you wanted, you, you are absolutely like, certain to get one. Yeah. And I respect you. So I was okay, you know, tell me about it. And then you told me the stats, which I've not looked up, but like you did tell okay, the, the average marriage, especially in the West, the divorce rate is about 40%. 40%. And that's just, that's just the divorce rate. Never mind the amount of marriages that don't really divorce for a long time for the, the length of the yeah. study, but then they're unhappy. It's they're real, dead fully, bedrooms. fully divorced. They don't like each other. Yeah. They've split up. Wife is cheating with the guy that she works with. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Husband has an affair. You know what I mean? There's, I'd say maybe 80% of marriages are <laughs> unhappy, Western style. Yeah, yeah. And then as soon as you told me that arranged marriages have like a 4%, 10 times less, 4% divorce rate, something just clicked in my mind. I was like, 40%. well, yeah, of course it does. Of course it does. It's, so arranged marriages, you're 10 times less likely to be divorced if you got arranged marriage instead of a normal Western marriage. Yeah. And this started to like click in my mind because I've done research on this, right? And what it, it actually... Essentially, all of our ideas of romance is, act is are actually BS. Romance is actually romance and love is a concept that's been made in the last few hundred years, and we've started to marry for love or you know get together for love instead of logistics. Mm. So hundreds, let's say thousands of years ago, hundreds of years ago, we only ever married Someone for like rational reasons because their family is a good family. Let's yeah. join together for strength and very important Tribal. stuff is that Tribal. woman right there. She's young, she's pure, she's a virgin. She, you know, she goes to church with us. We're gonna marry in front of the eyes of God and the eyes of Allah. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. And then we started to marry based, you know, the, the propaganda comes out about love and every, oh, love's really important guys. And we started to marry based on love, Attraction, which is- mostly. Emotions. Yeah, emotions. Emotions, basically. which yeah. emotions, 
can and sometimes last. be okay, but making lifelong huge decisions on emotions has never worked out for anyone really. Yeah. You need to make it for like clear, conscious, like written Objective. on paper, objectives, rational facts, which sounds really unsexy. But the thing is what's, what generally happens is people who seem to be married or you know get together because of rational logic through arranged marriages, the love develops, of course yeah. it does. But if a man and woman stay together, they make love they hundreds of times, they have children, love develops. Yeah. And the love develops based on this rational, strong foundation. And then that you know that this person's a good person. She has exactly. been raised the right values, been has the right morals. You know exactly. And her family has has taught that from to her from a young age. She has know? a strong masculine father who's religious, and right, he has yeah. been looking after her. And then when you compare that to the Western style, which you know I'm guilty of because this is how I've you know been raised. This is the choices I've made. The Western style is that her father's not in the home. Yeah. Mother's boyfriend's in the home instead. Yeah. Yeah. She's had sex when she was 12 years old or something mm. 20 body count and you know but she really it's really good i really love her guys uh, but the foundation's weak yeah. and, and we don't talk about this in the modern day because this is seen as evil Taboo. misogynist sexist yeah, everything yeah, yeah. and of course men you know we, we need to bring certain things to the table but you know i'm a straight man so i, I lock more of what i need in a woman and i've realized that doing it on mutual attraction generally doesn't really work that well relationships seem to need to come from a place of pure rational logic, which is so unsexy. Like looking at like this person, what what's his main values? What does he want out of life? What's totally. his goals? Yeah. Totally. And when you told me about arranged marriages and I thought, wait, okay, why, why is the success so high for arranged marriage? And it just hit me. It's like the kind of people who are going to sign up for that, well, they're going to be religious. Yeah. They're going to be coming from yeah. strong families. The arranged marriages is mainly like a merge of the two families, as you said earlier. Yeah. So when you have like a fight, she might go to her mom and tell her like, listen, this guy and, and having, and her mom who has a lot of experience because she's been married for a while would be like, this actually like, okay, this is what you do. You know, have mm. a talk, talk with him, communicate with him. That's so but important. oftentimes the Western society, they'll go to their group chat of like, five, six other girls who don't really have much experience. And they want to go out party married. tonight. And yeah, since she's and not like, partying, forget she's that not guy. single. We'll Come go on. out tonight. We'll and find even, your the new thing guy. Is, that's fun for them. Even that, okay, that's bad enough. But the same thing, okay, so in the, the arranged marriage or very religious family, she there's problems in the relationship as there's going to be yeah, know, two yeah. people joining together living. Of course there is. She goes to her family and they push her towards you again. No, it's okay. He did this. He'll apologize. He's a good, you know, they'll push you together. If let's say she even goes a Western woman, you you get into a Western style relationship based on love and you know, I date a woman from UK, for example, she goes to her family, they'll actually pull her away from you. Mm. They'll say, no, you're better than him, even yeah, though she's yeah. not. They'll say, no, like, you know, you, you don't need him, even though she kind of does. And you know, when, when her social network p splits you guys together, no matter how much she loves you, she has to, at some point, sway. Yeah. She has to. And then her friends are saying, it. oh, you know, we, there's dopamine. We can go pleasure. We can go get tonight. Let's go drink. Let's go party, girls. He's not letting you go out anymore. You're not as fun anymore. Social pressure, conformity. Come on, let's go. Her mom's like, oh, well, you know, like I was happier once I divorced your, your, your father and stuff. Uh, mm. When they pull you away, it's like, you, if you are going to get into a very serious relationship, you better hope that everyone in her family and social network wouldn't even accept her to try and split. They'd push her every single time to work things out with you. Yeah, exactly. Compromise, like make him work on this, this, this factor, and he'll work on it because he wants the longevity and vice versa, you know? So I wanted to ask you, aside from this topic, even though that was very interesting, um, what does like a day in your life look like? Okay. Uh, so wake up, 6.30. And 6.30 a.m. every day. Yeah. Yeah, pretty much. So my, the time I've been waking up for the last year, I've, I've been experimenting loads of different times, 4 a.m., 5 a.m., 6, um, sometimes 7, 8. Like, you know, I've been experimenting and I realized like 6 a.m. is about the time I could wake up every single day for the rest of my life. So that seems reasonable. Wake up, record some videos. Weekend, weekday, same thing. Yeah, yeah right? always. Uh, Andrew Huberman. That's I really like thing. Andrew Huberman, bro. He's, yeah. he's taught me a lot, man. And um, he said this, that there's, essentially there's, in the human brain, there's no such thing as a weekend. That's a that's a modern invention. Yeah, Weekends we don't even exist. It, yeah. It's just a belief that Apparently, we've Apparently, actually, I think uh, I heard that the... <laughs> I don't know if this is how true this is, but I heard the owner of Ford told all his staff to that there's a weekend and because he wanted to give them an extra day or so. So, so they, they could spend money. And they would re need a reason to have a car. Yeah. It, so it's all their staff It's another cars. aspect of, of like capitalism and yeah, materialism, yeah. actually. But it, it's a whole story for yeah. that. But essentially, like, it, think about your caveman brain doesn't know it, it's supposed to be a weekend. That's just like a modern day belief. So we're not actually supposed to change our behaviors on the weekends. People just do just because they're sleep deprived through the week. And so I'll sleep, or I'll have a lie in. But that actually really messes up your health. You need to be waking up at the exact same time every single day. No, there's, for me, I, you know, I'm, I'm very privileged. I'm a YouTuber. 
so it's like I don't work that much and like weekends, weekdays, doesn't matter. It's a weekday, right? Sometimes I don't know what day it is because it doesn't really matter. Do you yeah. know what I mean? It's, oh yeah, I've got a podcast today, but, but um, wake up always at the same time, first thing in the morning, record some videos and then just get ready for the gym. 9, 9 a.m. for me is absolute perfect time to train always. Yeah. That's you, why I messaged you. It's like, bro, let's, let's do the, the podcast yeah, yeah. at 9 a.m. Bro, so I'm going to be ready. Do you, do you still write the journal? Or later on yeah later so on, okay. do that do the sort of work fitness things first come back high protein everything and then um usually you know like do random tasks podcast videos whatever sp spend time with sam read books and then usually around 7 p.m is like the self-improvement time for me meditate gratitude journal affirmations? read affirmations i've started to do them around I, I, the day yeah now. i've been like in experimenting with it myself you know like obviously Man, I'm at the stage where like I'll try anything, like just give me any any step, I'll try it out, you know. So I've been like writing affirmations, like even there's like one like I read from this book called Magic of Thinking Big, and yeah. basically you read the book, yeah, man. bro. I love it. I speak yeah. about it. Oh, bro, I literally spoke about it today as well. Really? I, I so, recapped the book every few weeks, bro. Wow. So from that book, there's a part where he makes like the self commercial, yeah. where like. Uh, what's Tom Daly? Meet Tom Daly. Tom, yeah. You're an important person. So I basically just copied that full commercial. I just replaced the name with my name because I, I didn't want to make a whole commercial about myself. Yeah. But a lot of it applied anyways. So I just repeat that sometimes. And like, what do you think? Does the affirmations, does it help? Yeah, totally. So like, I mean, there's, it, it seemed a bit, you know, years ago, people didn't want to talk about affirmations, visualizations. Oh, it seems like woohoo. It seems like all fake and stuff and, you know, toxic positivity or something. No, no, no it's not. Because what we think on, a, I always give this example, right? For the, the guys, even women will understand this, right? What we think, the words we think in our brain genuinely change how we feel. People with anxiety who have anxious thoughts genuinely have higher levels of cortisol inside of them. Their, their cortisol, their stress hormone, like a real scientific thing, increases when you have an anxious thought in your mind. Mm. It's, you know, this, is, this has been proven for a long course, time. Like yeah. whatever words we think, and for guys, for example, if you think of a sexy thought, you'll start to get an erection. Mm. Even no, no physical stimulation, just the, the mental thought of the it. The mental creates the physical. Yeah. So why not go around your day, let's say you're in the gym, why not just, just to yourself, don't tell anyone you're doing this because it's kind of cringe. Why not just tell them, well, as soon as you're hitting a set, I'm strong, I'm strong, I'm strong. This, this weight's nice and light for me. Yeah, I'm strong, I'm gonna hit the 15 reps. I'm gonna hit the 15 yeah. reps. Everyone's looking, I'm gonna hit the 15 reps, I'm strong. Why not? Yeah. Because the thing is, it works. You can do a lot of preparations a before a lift. I heard where they told like a plant, they had two plants and they told one of it. Have you read the study? I've, I've heard, I don't believe this one. You don't believe this yeah. one? <laughs> I don't like Actually, it. It's, it's, it's weird, weird bro. Like they got a plant like that. <laughs> I love you. I love you. You're going to grow really big. And, like, this, and, and, this one was too. <laughs> and the one I told like negative thoughts, the one it said like the one it insulted a few times, it was like less. <laughs> yeah. I saw this with like, with ice or something like with some like molecule. I don't know what it was, but I saw yeah. it. I was like, okay, this is too far. I'm pretty yeah. sure those go. But there was the one which I read, well. which, is like, which made sense. It's like when you're, when you think about buying a new car, let's say you think about buying a Tesla. Suddenly all over the road, you see Teslas. Yeah. yeah there yeah. were not more Teslas yeah. today than there were yesterday. Yeah. But your mind, your, your, your focus on them. And this is particular bias. It's yeah. Called. There's, what's it called? I think it's called blue car bias. I don't know. I had this with my motorbike in the UK. Yeah. So I went to Thailand, rode around the scooters, really fun. So I went back to the UK, got the motorbike license, right. bought one, really sick. And then straight away when I bought one, I was like, whoa, there's so many guys are driving yeah. one, man. It's <laughs> the same amount. They're like, always just, the same, yeah. So if you can train your mind to look for opportunities, it will seem the same way like, like oh, so many opportunities around me. Yeah, exactly. But they were, they're already there. You just yeah. weren't looking for them. Yeah, so I mean, so then why not just encourage yourself in your yeah, own mind? Yeah. A lot of people, like they'll have deprecating thoughts and it's totally normal because, you, you know, some there's two versions so from the magic of thinking big this is one of the mindset i got there's like two kinds of thoughts there's automatic thoughts and there's manual thoughts automatic thoughts just happen automatically you don't control the them so bad. most of the time that they're, they're self deprecating the thought, yeah negative this it just happens you know you, you compare yourself a lot to people around you and everything yeah. you feel negative it's the random thoughts that pops into your mind that you didn't control but we can implant manual thoughts into our brain so right here right now like the viewer could literally take a second to think in his brain i'm strong you can, say, you can say those words in your brain, right? So what I found is that to change your automatic thoughts and to make them more positive and encouraging, which should be a goal for every single person, what we have to do is implant more manual thoughts of the kind that we eventually want to become automatic. The issue is we've implanted so many manual thoughts into our, uh, into our brain, the negative kind, negative that now our brain is producing negative wired. thoughts. It's wired to always give us negative yes, thoughts. So why not spend 20 minutes a day 
or you know, throughout the day as you do things, you know, I'm on the way here in my brain, like I was in the Uber here coming to the podcast in my brain. I'm like, this is gonna be a really good podcast. Right. Just outside me and Sam are hyping up. He's like, okay, you're, you're, you're a G, this is gonna be amazing. It's right. gonna be a really good performance. Right. Remember to do these things. It's gonna be good. You're gonna talk really well. It's gonna be encouraging, entertaining, informational podcast. Cause why wouldn't you? Cause yeah. the thing is there is science to do this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the only thing that stopped me from doing this for a few years was just, it just really felt cringe. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? It's just, oh yeah, like I'm, I'm a strong independent woman. Like, do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. It felt cringe for a long time, man. But as soon as I started doing it, and you, you know, I wrote mine down right. Yeah. So if anyone reads it, it'd be very cringe. Cause mine are literally like, oh, I'm an alpha male and I'm really strong and I'm like, you know, but the thing is it works. Yeah. It's your own benefit. Don't tell anyone about it. Yeah. Don't make the mistake I've just done publicizing it to the internet, yeah. right? Like there's a few that will really work for you. You'll know instantly because you'll instantly feel different. Yeah, and those are the ones like you need to work on those beliefs like you have not felt in your life. So you need to like really ingrain it. Yeah, for me, for me personally, actually it's slightly different. For me, the, the affirmations that really work are more like reminders of something that is true. So for example, obviously if something's true, it should be in your mind, but sometimes you forget things. Sometimes, you know, I'm just going about the day a little bit unconscious, thinking about something. And one of my affirmations, the one that's helped me the most is I'm confident. Because I am actually a pretty confident guy. Sometimes yeah. I just need a reminder when it pops into my mind, I'm confident. I know it's like, like I sit, sit a little bit taller. I'm like, you know, holding a better eye contact with people. And suddenly it's like, I'm, yeah. yeah, I am more confident. And, and I think you've said this before, the reciprocal feedback loop. So as you believe you're confident, you do a confident action. And then that ingrains yourself that you are confident. So and people treat you differently you as well, which is a positive. Yeah. Because yeah. if you say you're confident, then you stand up a little bit straighter, then someone treats you like you're more confident. And now you're because, confident. Yeah, and then at this point you're confident. <laughs> so why don't you just do the same thing? Okay, you're in yeah. the gym, I'm strong. You hit, I'm strong, I'm strong, I'm strong. You hit 15 you're reps, okay, strong. well you are strong then. Yeah, sick, sick, nice, yeah. All right, another question. How do you garner self-love? I don't know, bro. Tell me, bro. Really? Tell me, please, bro. <laughs> I've been thinking, like, I know that you said you, you struck, it's something that you're recently trying to, it's like your new journey. Yeah. And it's really a difficult one because we've not been taught about how to love ourselves, you know? It's almost seen as weird. Yeah. Like, wh why, yeah. why do you love yourself so much, you know? Yeah. You, I hate when people, like, I really dislike when people yeah, say, like, why you're, do you love You're yourself? narcissistic. Yeah. Well, you're like, no, if, if you can love yourself, if you can find a you way to do it, then that's amazing. Yeah. yeah. So in, in some ways I've developed self-love through through self-improvement. So you know that concept again of the, the sacrifice, pain, pleasure thing. Being proud of yourself. When you delay gratification. Being proud of your, your past years. Yeah, exactly. Being grateful for your younger self because the, he put in the work for you to get to this point where you're happy in life. Mm. Like it's, it's the unsexy answer because people would love to do something fast that causes self-love. The only way that I know is to literally build yourself up with sacrifice today so that your future self has a better life, the life that he wants so that he can look back and think, thank you, younger me. Mm. So I think this about my, my physique, for example, it's one of like, one of my rare accomplishments, which like I, I value huge. a lot. You're you know what I mean? Like I've, I've put in eight years of, of work and you know, I've made a loads of mistakes. My yeah. diet was trash for a long time. You know what I mean? But, but either way, Sometimes I go shirtless, I'm about to get into the shower or something. I just look at myself. You have a 1% body. I can't 1 help but to feel yeah. grateful for the 17 year old version of me who was who's literally going in the gym, feeling the burn and, and he didn't do it for himself. He did it for me. Mm. That's that's a bit of self-love from yeah. me, but I will because tell- At that time when he was doing it, he didn't see any difference. Yeah, of course. Like, but you delay it for your future self, yeah. which which in my opinion, that that's at least a form of self-love. There is another one, which is like this psychological thing of like, I am enough, I love myself. And that's the one that- Looking which in the I'm, mirror and you're like, I love you, I love you, I love not, you. Not so much like that though. <laughs> I think that's a bit weird. <laughs> It's not kissing the mirror and stuff. Like, what are you doing tonight? Like, what, what's your type of music? Like, no, I heard like your first thing in the morning, you go in the mirror, you're like, I love you. To the mirror. It, it probably, yeah, that could honestly yeah. work. If the affirmations work, like I just said, okay, yeah. I'm strong. Well, then why don't you do another one? I love myself. Yeah. Honestly, that, that yeah. you probably make some progress. But I will say there is an aspect of self love that I'm yet to grasp. I, I still have huge problems with feeling like I'm enough. Insecure, yeah. Yeah. Some, I wouldn't say it's Insecure, much. Insecure, but like, you don't feel like you've done enough. Because, like, as you said, like, visual who you want to be and then I'll feel happy in who you are which yeah. is like a big gap yeah it's like you're like it's like conflicting kind of yeah because it's, kind of, it's almost like ironic or like contradicting because at the same time you want to be happy as who you are but you're told no you're not supposed to be happy like this because if you're happy like this what's your motivation to improve so we need to go get a, the good grades I think you first have to, yeah you got I think it's a it's a balance that you have to have where like they say don't judge the day by the harvest that you reap, mm. but by the seeds that you sow. Mm. So if you did the work today, you should be happy. Not that you, you don't look jacked or like who you are. You did, you did work, you had a productive day. So that's enough reason to be happy. They say be patient with results, but impatient with action. Mm. So like just trying to focus on action, I guess is, is the way, but yeah. Guys, so Hamza's in the toilet. So we're asking Sam, he got nervous because of the questions. I'm joking, but we have, we're asking Sam. Sam is Hamza's right hand man <laughs> and best friend. 
Uh, very good guy. Top G. Top G. Uh, <laughs> what's a day in your life with Hamza? Day in the life. Well, the thing is with with me and Hamza. Yeah. Um, we don't care where we are, right? It's it's more based around as long as we're in close proximity, because a lot of our work is actually just being close together and uh, sort of thinking of ideas and brainstorming. Yeah. So I was I was joking with Hamza. We're we're in Dubai right now. You know, we're living quite bougie. It's quite nice. But honestly, like me and Hamza, we're we're the type of dudes where we could have a mattress on the floor. We'd be happy. We'd be happy as long as we're in close proximity and together. Because yeah. I think the, the the peak of life will always be. I think, I think Tate said this. Hang with the boys. Yeah, he says this. Yeah, it's the most Hanging fun thing. Hanging with the boys. You can do anything you want, but that's the most fun thing. Yeah. Uh, what is your happiest and saddest moments of your life? Okay, uh, the happiest was in uh, 2020. I had just moved back home to my parents' house, and I moved there from um, living in the student city where I was in university. So I went to university. I partied. I, I took uh, a lot of subscribers. Like, were you on at that point? Literally none. Like oh, I just, just started. Anything. Yeah. So I went. I moved to university, age nineteen, and you know, I, I, instant gratification, dopamine, drugs, party, and everything like that. I got into that hedonistic, degenerate lifestyle. Then I, uh, I graduated from university with a quite low, like I got the degree, but it was like quite a low. It was um, third honors, which essentially means like, yeah, you're kind of stupid. Like, and actually, I did actually, um, I didn't even pass. Actually, I, I got 35%, which is very low. And the pass rate's 40%. Yeah. And they gave me a compensatory pass. Like, just cause oh, I was like, oh. Participation. Cool. Yeah, just, here you go. As a participation trophy. Yeah, you've technically got a degree, but like you're, you're kind of stupid. So just go. So I wasn't eligible for any like good jobs but or anything. This, like, this, I'm talking about the, this is the yeah, happiest so, moment. So this was, no, no, this, so first remember, like the, the pain to the okay. it always starts with pain so this was then the life i was living overnight i went from being like a party boy university student to just unemployed and just broke mm -hmm. and everything and reality hit me hard i remember I used to cry every day thinking like oh this is actually life now you know when you're in when you're in school you have you're blinded by this this bias of like oh you know like life's kind of easy oh you know i yeah, see my friends every day like, in front of you you're in yeah. school now, you're in year eight, you have your nine, your 10, yes. you have university. You're in, you're in the, you're in the, you're in the oh, social life. You're in the herd, you're what, in the herd. What herd matters protect. is, oh, you know, like tomorrow is, is science class yeah. and you know, oh, my friend tomorrow party, all this, okay, fine. And then when you're actually unemployed, the first time you, you realize, okay, shit, like, I'm un unemployed, I don't know. And no one's coming to save you now. Nobody's no telling you, go here, go there. Yeah. You're on your own. Go figure it out now. Two weeks ago, I was asking my, asking to go to the toilet or something. Do you know what I mean? Like I was submitting work. I was like a, still almost like a child. And now, okay, go apply for your own job. So I'm on Indeed, sending my crappy CV to like hundreds of places. And for the first time in my life, like I'd had, you know, part-time jobs and I always got the job instantly in, in the interview. First time in my life, I'm having interviews, which I'm not getting the job, which is obviously very like, you know, you feel negative, I'm broke. I'm getting like transport to these interviews. I'm spending money, you know, it's horrible time, smoking weed every day and being a degenerate, eating bad food. And you know, de like depression, yeah. anxiety starts to creep in. I'm living with a girl who I didn't even trust, mm. who, you know, was like, the girl I loved, but I didn't, you know what I mean? It was easy, it was comfortable, it was just old habit. I was with her for like three years, yeah. which is you know more than 10% of my life at the time. This was probably the worst time of my life because especially around March, April, 2020, when COVID hit, lockdown hit, I couldn't even go to the gym. And you know, like everyone, yeah, I did yeah. like two home workouts and then just stopped. I was genuinely waking up, smoking weed straight away from the morning, eating junk food, everything. And, and I'd stay up till like 12 a.m. I can't even call my girlfriend, you know, the girl I lived with wasn't officially like, just not even roommate. Like we, we were together, yeah. but it's like, I didn't even see her as my girl. I just didn't even like her. She didn't even like, me. it was just toxic. She'd go to bed, but you know, technically she's my girlfriend, right? She'd go to bed and it'd be like, I'd go and masturbate like three times. Damn. Do you know what I mean? It, it's 1am, 2am, 3am, 4am. Like I'm down bad. I'm like that guy who's staying up that late, it's just purposes. eating, eating the worst food, just watching. BS content and porn and everything, video games by myself, just always high. And when you're always high, you're pretty much not high anymore. And you know, your baseline's yeah, just so low at this a, point. You don't feel it. Yeah. And so this was the worst period of my life. And then literally just a few weeks later, started to become the happiest when I moved out. All of my vices instantly stopped. All of them, junk food, wow. drugs, video games. Sometimes it takes a change of surrounding. Yeah, it was the environment for me. Yeah. I didn't realize how important it was. I you went back into home. Your parents yeah, parents' house. house. And my parents' house wasn't perfect. You know, they they eat quite a lot of junk food and yeah. everything. I could have still played video games, but it was the fresh start that I wanted. I used to say, 
that um, whilst I was, you know, in that situation in, in the student city with all the dopamine, all the bad habits that I wish I could just lock myself in, in just a room all day so I could just like put in the work to make some money online and, you know, try and create this life that I have here. Without distraction. Yeah. And um, that's what I kind of got in, in yeah. my parents' house. My parents didn't distract me. They respected, like I was extremely lucky to come back home and there was no pressure for me to get a normal job nice. or anything. Like I was so lucky that my parents, they supported they for me. Huh? They trusted that you'd, you'd figure out something. Yeah, they, they, they saw it. You know, if, if I told them, oh, I want to be a YouTuber and they saw me like playing games and stuff, they probably eventually would have took, like, you know, wanted, like been telling me, oh, go and get a job and everything, fine. But when I told them that and they, they seemed to believe it straight away and took it seriously. And I had like literally 10 subscribers at the time that I told them I'm, I'm going to become a YouTuber. Full I think YouTube. this is the first time that my parents respected me because they literally saw me like put in the work for this. I woke up at the same level, the like, same time that my dad does about 5 a.m., 4.30 yeah, yeah. and stuff. And I'm literally outside and like you can't, bro, imagine your son wakes up at the same time as you and you're you're an early riser, like you're a grind yeah. type of guy and you, he's already outside he's skipping. Putting, he's putting the work. The respect was there straight away and they he saw me get- you skipping. Do you know what I mean? I'm, he's I'm, like, he's a half tired and he's like, like you're like, I'm like, shredded, literally shredded, disciplined, no bad habits at yeah. all right now. Literally like, you know, I've certainly got bad habits, certain things I need to improve on. But at this point, as close as like, as perfect towards that goal of like, you know, just getting YouTube off the ground as, as it possibly could have been. And so for a good couple of months, I was on a total dopamine detox. I was doing absolutely no bad habits at all, just pure masculine focus on this one goal. And like I said, progress is happiness. Mm. And so literally I started to feel, it's so good because, you know, the happiest moment of my life, bro, there was no video games. There was no stimulation. There was no porn. There, there wasn't even any girls, bro. <laughs> literally, as soon as the first girl came in after that, which for men, you'll know this, it's like when you're feeling down bad and you're horny and, and, and you're lonely and you're needy, there's no women around. And as soon as you stop to focus on that and you start to focus on yourself, you focus on that very big, important goal and you develop yourself and you've lost 5% extra body fat and you're getting more like yeah. successful yeah. confidence. That's when the woman comes in and then like, uh, it yeah. wasn't it wasn't drastic, but yeah. it, you know, my life yeah. went up and then it went down like slightly. So, like, yeah, it took a nose dive. So, no, no, yeah. to be fair, it didn't go down once I got like, you know, the first girl after this kind of period. But it just I got, like, it, it, it plateaued. I wouldn't even say, I'd say it still went up because you know, the YouTube channel yeah. still took off, my physique still, less, you know what I mean? Okay. But it, it's, it was like this, like it went up like this and then maybe like this, mm, do you know what I mean? Which is, yeah. it's just enough. And when you think about how many times that's happened, for you, not so much because you know, you're yeah, going yeah, the Muslim yeah. route, but for me, I went the degenerate route. And when you think about how many times that's happened in your life where you're climbing so hard because you have this, this masculine desire to, th there's two masculine desires in terms of sex, right? One is either go and have sex right now, and if you can't, because there's no woman to have sex with, then there's two options you have. Go and watch porn and masturbate, or go and improve yourself till eventually you have that woman yeah. to do. And that's the way healthier one. Yeah. And number two for me, what's amazing. Your, yeah, what's your thing? Yeah. And I think like you said about the happiness part, you know, happiness is not like, um, I don't think it's like some, so much as like a moment, because usually that's dopamine. I think it's about peace, you know? They say like real happiness is, is peace. And just like, uh, if you chase happiness, you're kind of like, as you said, hedonism, which is like chasing the next pleasure, the next hit, the next hit, the, the dope, yeah, then the yeah, yeah. yeah. Like you just want to see, you're just seeking pleasure, and that that's sort of like um, when you realize that peace is actually the real target. Like, how can you just be peaceful in this moment in your own thoughts? You know, you can sit in a room without a phone and just spend time alone, and you're just happy, you're just comfortable in your own skin, and you just feel good about who you are. That was one of my best pieces of advice in my, in my opinion. You know, I've made almost a thousand videos, right? And I still think one of my best pieces of advice is when I tell people like, even, you know, if you continue watching my YouTube video, I make more money and stuff, but for your own good, close the browser, close your computer, don't look at your phone, put everything away. Just, just try this, right? You put everything this, yeah. away. Just stare at your wall for half an hour. Yeah. Literally just stare at your wall for half an hour and just see what happens. Because for a lot of people, it'll be intense boredom. They need some stimulation. And you know, to them, they'll think, oh yeah, yeah, this is stupid. I'm not wasting my time with this anyway. And they don't realize that essentially they're, they're the modern day equivalent of a crackhead, like a, a, a smart a Instagram head at this point. Do you know what I mean? Like they need that stimulation. But for the person who can discipline themselves just to sit there for half an hour and just look into their wall, you'll learn a lot about yourself. And if you've got a smile on your face through this point, then you know that whatever you've yeah. been doing recently has been working. Yeah. And for some periods of my life, I've been able to sit there, no stimulation, no distraction, no phone, no computer, no one else, and literally just feel blissful, peaceful, mm. because I know that I'm on the right track to something that's important nice. to me. That's the ultimate goal, I yeah. guess. So that's, that's my perspective as a man who's becoming more masculine. And I would assume for people, mostly women who are quite feminine, it'd be the same thing, you know, stare at the wall and you would feel good about yourself and happy and you'd smile if the love in your life was 
flourishing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, damn, that's crazy. And I think, like you said, about the stimulation. And when you when you say stimulation, I heard... And by the way, a lot of the things I'm saying right now in this podcast is stuff that I've learned from your videos. So you've had a massive impact. I'm extremely grateful for that. And Thank it's, you. it's helped me a lot in my growth, 100%. But anyways... Um, what I was going to say is when, when you always seek stimulation, sometimes what happens is the most things that you should look forward to, like let's say going for a walk, they become extremely boring because you're chasing stimulation. And what also happens, which is actually really bad, is when you're having a walk, because your brain wants you to be stimulated, it starts shooting thoughts at you. Mm. And these thoughts can oftentimes be negative thoughts. So while you're just uh, having a walk, your brain feels like it's, it's bored, it needs stimulation. So it'll just start shooting thoughts at you. Because you know when you're scrolling to TikTok, you're having these emotions, this emotional roller coaster where like you're having all these videos, like one's making you super happy, one's mm. making you super sad, one's making you super angry, one's making you. And because now when you take out the TikTok, you don't have that emotional roller coaster anymore. Sometimes your brain will shoot at you thoughts. And this is what I what I saw in, in a video, and it actually makes a lot of sense if you think about it. Yeah, well, this is the destruction of everyone's attention span. Yeah. Every time you're on TikTok and you scroll down, you see a new piece of content, new topic, new setting, new new situation, new humor, whatever context. Every zero point seven seconds, Instagram, same thing, right? Yeah. Every time. And so, essentially, what you're doing, people don't realize this: TikTok and Instagram, those are workout routines to destroy your attention yeah, span. Yeah. Those are and workout routines have to form, become cool. Don't yeah, yeah, yeah. This is why I think you've tried to call me previously. It's like every, people get surprised by this and I don't get why. Like I say it to everyone all the time, put your phone on. It doesn't make sense Always to me. Do not disturb. My for phone has, years, has not been off to do not disturb for about two and a half years, Damn. literally. Obviously, you know, sometimes I know someone's going to call me like a delivery driver, so I'll take it off. But generally like the default mode is do not disturb, silent. And then also I, every time I get a new phone, I go onto the settings and disable all the notifications as well. No, so it's no like the only time I actually see that I have a notification on an app, like WhatsApp, for when example, you want to check. is when I I open up WhatsApp. I don't like, I, I don't understand how people do this. I think there was a point when I started to develop a lot more respect for myself and I realized the power of my attention and my time. And I, I don't know, I, I just saw it as like disrespectful for myself to literally, I get pissed off. If I see my phone like go off, it doesn't happen. But if I do, it annoys me. When I see it in someone else, like I always say this to Sam, bro, how does your phone, like he had an Android for a long time. Sorry, bro, he had an Android. <laughs> he had an Android for a long time, bro. I'm sat next to him trying to work and all I hear is, I'm like, bro, I lose it's respect. Your I lose yeah. respect for you every time, bro. Like how it, it destroys. I don't understand because it's so clear. There's no value in that. Mm. You don't. The thing is, people respect you more when you reply a bit slower, anyway, because they realize, okay, your attention, your time is valuable. So they actually appreciate. They're grateful for the time you put yeah. in. And so, if you don't respect yourself enough to think, okay, I will see the notification on this app when I actually manually, consciously choose to see it. Damn, I don't like if my phone has. Let me show you right now. My phone has this thing as well. See? What's your hand? Look, the screen's not on. Ah. I've disabled this thing as well. So it's like, you know, so, so some people, if you lift your phone up, the screen goes on yeah, straight. Like that's, the, that's the default mode. I've disabled yeah. that as well. No notifications, no nothing. Damn. And the, you know, this, it hurt my ego because for a long time I was, you know, the party boy, the social guy. You enjoy. So it was amazing, bro, yeah. amazing. How does someone with no money today start to make money? Someone with relatively no or less money, one of your fans, how can they start making money? Like you, self-made millionaire. I, I wouldn't say self-made first of all but I've, I've had a very very supportive family i've had You're very right, supportive friends man. everything so i wouldn't say self-made i'd say like group made more like it because the support has always been there for me so that's first of all but to do it my way which i did it through social media through just you know recording youtube videos and monetizing it as best as i could i realized that it's literally just all about increasing the number of people in the world who like you and then, so you, online's the best way, right? You can do that in, in person, you could do some, you know, you can own a gym or whatever. But I think the single greatest tool that we have to make money, I think the new gold rush is step one, Reputation. build an audience that likes you. Step two, sell them something that is somewhat wholesome and fits with the Helps brand. Them. Literally, yeah. perfect. So build the audience, That's be a likable person, spread out a good message that, you know, and is related to you. And you don't have to do it yourself because I think you can do now there's like things called YouTube automation. So like you create like motivational videos, let's say with your face or let's say with just B-roll clips and you put like, you find like voiceovers and you compile them. Mm. But you basically try to create, create content that you would the, the issue with that route, a lot of people ask me it's this different. with like YouTube and like, oh, what if I, you know, just post like, like point, pointless videos of like, oh, pictures that show like, oh, how the top seven things to do in Greece. But the thing is like, bro, no one cares about you. you, know, you know I mean, it's like yeah. no one knows you then at this point. You're so you try improving. and sell them something, they're not going to yeah. buy it. So yeah, enjoy you your YouTube. You have a connection. 
they yeah, can get some YouTube revenue, but it's not going to be that high. It's like, okay, whatever. The way I do it is just be like a good person, learn how to communicate, just read how to win friends and influence people like yeah. 50 times. And then just like give, times. you know, just yeah. give a good message and then people will begin to like you. Find some kind of product, like you can make money from AdSense and I think that's pretty much the only social media platform you get paid directly. I don't think uh, your TikTok's yeah. got it. And Maybe. then just find some kind of thing to link them, which is wholesome. Don't, you know, oh, the first sponsor and it's Teach Hanley skincare or something that you don't even use yourself create something yourself that is so on point that the 0.1% of people who, of your audience who have got money, who usually buy that thing in the first place will now give you their money instead of them giving it to someone right. else. And and oftentimes to you, they can get a discount code. So it's even cheaper than how much they usually buy. Exactly. For. Hamza, thank you so much for your time. It's been a pleasure. Big fan. So I really appreciate this. I feel like I've manifested this podcast because six months ago, I messaged Hamza to do this podcast and six months later, it finally happened. So thank you so much, bro. Thank Pleasure. you. Bro. Appreciate you, bro. Yeah, thank you for watching, guys. Take care. Have a good day.